And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Apatosaurus, which was a request from Cole via Patreon, and also I figured we should be doing a sauropod for this episode. How have you not done Apatosaurus yet? <laughs> uh, we focused on Brontosaurus and Camarasaurus, you know. Now we've got the trifecta. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> So Apatosaurus was a sauropod that lived in the Jurassic in what is now North America, and its name means deceptive wizard. It was named in 1877 by Othniel Charles Marsh, who named the first known species Apatosaurus ajax. The Apatosaurus holotype was found in 1860 in Gunnison County, Colorado. Marsh gave Apatosaurus its name because of its chevron bones, which are similar to mosasaurs and not other dinosaurs. When this skeleton was being excavated and transported, its bones were mixed with another Apatosaurus specimen, which was originally actually described as Atlantosaurus imanis. So for some of those features, it's unclear if they belong to Apatosaurus or Atlantosaurus. Marsh said that the difference between Apatosaurus and Atlantosaurus was the number of sacral vertebrae. Apatosaurus had three and Atlantosaurus had four. Lots of Apatosaurus species have been named, as you can imagine, Based on fragments, Marsh named many species during the Bone Wars. <laughs> so did Cope. <Yeah. laughs> so Marsh named Apatosaurus Ajax in 1877 after Ajax, a Greek mythology hero. The holotype is incomplete and it hasn't been studied as much as other species. Atlantosaurus Imanis may be a junior synonym of Apatosaurus Ajax, but again, it's confusing. Bones were mixed together, all that. Marsh named Apatosaurus grandis in 1877, but then he reassigned that to Morosaurus in 1878, and Morosaurus is now considered to be a synonym of Camarasaurus. There's also Apatosaurus parvus, which was first described in 1902 by Peterson and Gilmore as Elosaurus, and then reclassified as Apatosaurus in 1994, and then in 2015 it was reassigned to Brontosaurus. Yay! (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> There's also Apatosaurus minimus, which was originally described in 1904 as Brontosaurus by Osborne. And then Henry Mook named it Apatosaurus minimus in 1917. And then in 2012, Mike Taylor and Matt Wadle described material as Apatosaurus minimus. So that one's a little unclear. In 1957, Albert Felix de la Parent and George Zivesky named Apatosaurus Alincorensis, based on material found in Portugal, but in 1990 this was reclassified as Camarasaurus, and in 1998 it was renamed to Lurinhosaurus. In 1994, James Fila and Patrick Redman named Apatosaurus Yanapin, which in 1998 Bob Barker made the type species of a new genus Eobrontosaurus, and then Emmanuel Shop reclassified that as Brontosaurus in 2015. Another win for Brontosaurus. Hmm. Anyway. <laughs> William Holland named Apatosaurus Luisae in 1916 based on a partial skeleton found in Utah. And for a long time, as many of you know, Brontosaurus was thought to be a junior synonym of Apatosaurus. And in 1879, Marsh named Brontosaurus Excelsus. Elmer Riggs described a diplodocid found in Colorado in 1903, and he thought that where it was found was similar in age to where Marsh found Brontosaurus. And then Riggs compared the skeleton with Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus Ajax and found that the holotype for Apatosaurus Ajax was a juvenile and that the features that distinguished Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus were not valid. Apatosaurus was named first, which is why Brontosaurus was thought to be a junior synonym. But then Bob Bakker argued in the 1990s that Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus were two separate genera. And Shop and others reclassified Brontosaurus as a valid genus in 2015, though not everyone agrees, and we go into much more detail about this in episode 100, where we got to interview Shop. Yeah, but I don't think anybody has formally disagreed and, you know, gone into the literature in a peer review publication and said, no, Brontosaurus doesn't count because of this, this, and this. So I think it's pretty much holding up. Yeah, I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so the name Brontosaurus stuck around even when it wasn't considered a valid genus. It was always its own species, though. So it's not like, you know... The Excelsis I'm, part. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so it was, didn't go away completely. Exactly. It's just whether or not it's different enough to be its own genus. Yeah. But Thunder Wizard, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, Elmer Riggs had published his findings in an obscure journal, so not many people knew about his conclusions at the time. And, I mean, I talk to people all the time where 
nobody knows that history. Some people still think that Brontosaurus isn't actually real and or some never knew about the history. Mm-hmm. So Brontosaurus slash Hippotosaurus was the first sauropod skeleton mounted. It was specimen number 460, occasionally assigned to Apatosaurus, sometimes Brontosaurus. It was mounted in the American Museum of Natural History, and that one was found in 1898 by Walter Granger in Wyoming. The mounted skeleton was missing the head, feet, and parts of the tail, so Apatosaurus feet and parts of the tail found in the same quarry were used, and the skull was sculpted based on the, quote, biggest, thickest, strongest skull bones, lower jaws, and tooth crowns from three different quarries, Hmm. end quote which were probably from Camarasaurus, which was the only other sauropod at the time with known good skull material. And so that is how it came to be that Brontosaurus had a Camarasaurus head. (laughs) Slash the Potosaurus. Adam Herman oversaw the mount, and he sculpted a stand-in skull by hand. And Osborne said that it was, quote, largely conjectural and based on that of Morosaurus, which is now Camarasaurus. And the mount was labeled as Brontosaurus. Because the American Museum of Natural History was so popular, Brontosaurus became one of the most well-known dinosaurs. The name Brontosaurus is also used a lot in pop culture. It started with Gertie the Dinosaur, you've got the Lost World, and it's also the logo of the Sinclair Oil Company. It's Dino in the Flintstones, and it was a dinosaur stamp in 1989, which they defended that. All amongst it technically not being a valid genus at the time. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So... Anyway, back to the skull. Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus, but we're talking about Apatosaurus here, had a skull similar to Diplodocus, though for a long time it was thought to be similar to Camarasaurus. Its skull, though, was relatively small. There was an Apatosaurus skull found in 1909 in an expedition led by Earl Douglas in the Carnegie Quarry at Dinosaur National Monument. It was found near the Apatosaurus Louisae specimen, which was named after Louis Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie's wife. The skull was similar to Diplodocus. And Douglas and William H. Holland and other scientists thought that it was an Apatosaur skull, but not everybody agreed, such as Henry Fairfield Osborne, who mounted the Apatosaur skeleton with the Camarasaur skull cast in the American Museum of Natural History. Anyway, Holland defended his view in 1914, but he did not mount a head on the Carnegie Museum skeleton. Possibly he was waiting for an articulated skull and neck to be found to confirm that it was the right skull. But then he died in 1934, and the museum staff put a Camarasaurus skull in their mount. <laughs> Yale Peabody Museum sculpted a skull for their mount based on the lower jaw of a Camarasaurus and Marsh's 1891 illustration. In the 1970s, John Stanton McIntosh and David Berman redescribed Diplodocus and Apatosaurus skulls, and they found that a Apatosaurus skull was similar to Diplodocus, and that many skulls thought to be Apatosaurus were actually Diplodocus, so they reassigned some of those skulls. And then in 1979, the Carnegie Museum mounted the first true Apatosaurus skull. In 2011, the first articulated Apatosaurus skull was described. The specimen had similar cervical vertebrae as Apatosaurus ajax and different neck and skull features from Apatosaurus louisa. Mossberger found the first Apatosaurus ajax snout in 2013. Brigham Young University has a specimen with a well-preserved skull and skeleton and a preserved brain case, which was found in western Colorado. Apatosaurus has been found in the Morrison Formation in Colorado, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Utah. It was the second most common sauropod found in that formation. Camarasaurus was the first. The most complete Apatosaurus found so far is nicknamed Einstein. Mm. (laughs) It turns out Apatosaurus may have been more solitary than other dinosaurs in the Morrison Formation. Other dinosaurs that lived in the same time and place include Allosaurus, Camarasaurus, Diplodocus, Stegosaurus, Carnivores, in particular, that lived in the same time and place included Ceratosaurus, Allosaurus, and Torvosaurus. Apatosaurus is part of the family Diplodocidae. Other dinosaurs include Diplodocus, Supersaurus, and Barosaurus. It's also part of the subfamily Apatosaurinae, which was named in 1929. And the only other genus in that subfamily is Brontosaurus. Apatosaurus had a stockier build than Diplodocus. On average, it was about 69 to 75 feet or 21 to 23 meters long and weighed about 18 to 25 short tons, though some were longer and weighed more. Apatosaurus had necks that were different from other diplodocids, and they may have used them for intraspecific combat, you know, between themselves. They had these paired spines, which gave them a wide, thick, and long neck and a deep chest. And there's a lot of debate over how flexible or inflexible the neck was. 
So some say Apatosaurus may have had an inflexible neck held horizontally to a slightly upwards angle. They may have, there may have been some niche partitioning so different types of sauropods could live together. A 2009 study argued that Apatosaurus may have held its neck high and had a flexible neck based on comparisons with extant animals, animals that are still living. There's been some debate over how Apatosaurus used its neck for feeding. Was it a high browser or a low browser? So Kent Stevens and Michael Parrish in 1999 and 2005 said that Apatosaurus had a wide neck range of movement. In 2013, Matthew Cobley and others said that it had limited neck movement due to large muscles and cartilage, and also that sauropods like Diplodocus may have moved their whole bodies to eat and may have spent more time foraging. However, Taylor found that Apatosaurus had a flexible neck. A 2013 study looked at the flexibility of ostrich necks, which are the most similar to sauropod necks, and they found that previous models of neck flexibility didn't account for soft tissues, so in the end, it's unclear how flexible and how <laughs> high Apatosaurus necks could be held. <laughs> On the tail side, though, Apatosaurus probably kept its tail above the ground for counterbalance. It had tall neural spines, and the tail was slender. They may have used their tails as a whip to create loud sounds. In 1997, Nathan Mirvold and Philip Curry did a computer simulation of an Apatosaurus tail and found it could make a whip-like sound of more than 200 decibels. The tail was probably too slender at the tip, though, so it couldn't hurt predators and be used as a weapon, and it may have been damaged if they used it for attack. That's an interesting comment, because the slenderness of the tip doesn't seem like much of a factor to me in terms of damaging, you know what I mean? Because, like, whips... I don't know. Seems like you can still do a pretty good cutting at the end with a thin tail. I don't have a tail. (laughs) I don't know. There's one Apatosaurus tail that's been found with a pathology, and this was caused by a growth defect. Apatosaurus, like many other sauropods, were originally thought to have been semi-aquatic, though people no longer think that this is true. They were definitely terrestrial. Apatosaurus was quadrupedal, with forelimbs being slightly shorter than hind limbs, and sauropod trackways show that they may have moved up to 12 to 19 miles or 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. Apatosaurus probably had a similar respiratory system as birds with air sacs in the neck, which would have helped also make their bones lighter. They may have had a warm-blooded metabolism. They had a large body mass with a relatively small surface area, which means the body had thick internal organs and the outer layers of tissue insulated the internal layers, so there would have been a high base temperature. And this may mean that Apatosaurus metabolism may have worked similarly to mammals. I've never heard that side of being warm-blooded Meaning thick internal organs. Yeah. That's interesting. (laughs) Do your internal organs feel thick to you? I don't know, I guess. I mean, when you look at some animal, you know, like you look at a kidney or a heart, it does have pretty thick walls Mm -hmm. and the muscles, but weird. (laughs) So another reason Apatosaurus may have had a warm-blooded metabolism is based on how fast juveniles grew. And as you know, like with many sauropods, they grew quickly, and then they became near full size around 10 years. This is based on a study in 1999. Thomas Lehman and Holly Woodward found in 2008 that Apatosaurus may have grown 25 tons in 15 years, peaking at 11,000 pounds or 5,000 kilograms in one year, based on growth lines and length-to-mass ratios. Another method with limb length and body mass found that Apatosaurus grew 1,150 pounds or 520 kilograms per year and reached full weight at 70 years old. So that's very different. (laughs) But these estimates are not considered to be reliable since old growth lines would have been messed up by bone remodeling. Yeah, it's hard to count the lags in the sauropod bones. But I think they recently were pretty successful with the rib bones and they came to the conclusion that they're roughly around 30 So that agrees a little bit more with the first one. Mm -hmm. Either way, though, you're putting on multiple pounds a day, which is quite a bit of growing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, hard to fathom what that would be like. Yeah. (laughs) So some specimens' ages have been estimated of Apatosaurus. Eva Grebeler and others in 2013 found that one specimen reached maturity at age 21 and died at age 28, and another reached maturity at age 19 and died at age 31. There's been a lot of juvenile apatosauruses found. Juveniles tend to have shorter necks and tails and a bigger difference between the length of their forelimbs and hindlimbs. Apatosaurus footprints were found in Morrison, Colorado in 2008 that indicated that juveniles could run on two legs, and I love picturing that. (laughs) That's pretty funny. 
They had a claw on each forelimb and three claws on each hind limb. And the claw on the forelimb may have been used for defense. Unlikely, though, based on the shape and size. It also could have been used for feeding. Most likely it was used to grab things like tree trunks when they were rearing up. Apatosaurus was an herbivore and it had chisel-like teeth. It was a general browser and it kept its head elevated. It could probably eat 880 pounds or 400 kilograms of food per day. Oof. Yeah. It had gut microbes to help them digest vegetation, and they may have swallowed lots of food without chewing. In 2014, there was a Brontosaurus hoax article going around that claimed that John Moore University in the UK cloned a baby Apatosaurus nicknamed Spot and included a picture of a hairless baby kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> And last, there's an Apatosaurus song by Storybots on YouTube. It's a kid's song, and it's not that scientifically accurate, but it's kind of catchy. One of the lines is, my neck's so long and so strong. I can't think of the melody right now. But we have a link in case you want to check it out. It's very much a kid's song. Yeah. Garrett did not like it. No. (laughs) (laughs) But if you like Apatosaurus, hey, it's probably the only song to choose from. (laughs) 